Good evening. Good to see you tonight. Welcome, everybody. A warm welcome also to our guests and visitors. It's good to have you with us. This is a worship service that also goes online and on TV and on the radio, and so welcome to all of those worshipers, and a big thank you to those that work so hard to get this service out into all those different places. As we worship tonight, we're going to be centering on our greatest needs. That would be the overall theme for these worship services. The individual theme for tonight is our greatest needs a champion for the defeated. As you hear God's word today, please take it with you into your life. Talk about it with others. Apply it to your everyday life. And encourage one another in your Christian faith. Once again, welcome to our guests too. Warm welcome. Please, if you'd like to make St. John's your home congregation, all my information is on the back side of the worship folder. You can easily get a hold of me. For those who are going to be listening on the radio, I'm Pastor Timothy Miller, and I'll be conducting the service and preaching the sermon, and our organist for this evening is Mrs. Bethany Babinick. Our opening hymn is hymn number 556, but before that, we have a recording of the preschool children. They are going to be singing live tomorrow morning at 1030, but we like to record them and then play it for each service so that all of you can enjoy it. And so right after that recording, we'll be singing hymn 556, All Mankind Fell in Adam's Fall, from the Blue Hymnal. The songs the children are going to be singing are, and the lyrics are found in the bulletin around page 6, if you'd like to follow along. I am Jesus' little lamb, and go my children.
Please stand. Our order of worship can be found on the big screens, and much of it in the blue hymnal setting one, beginning on page 154. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, be with you. Mighty God and Father, our Lord Jesus walked into the wilderness to face the devil's temptations. But he did not succumb to Satan lies or falter in his resolve to save the world from the prison of hell. Bolster our faith by his mighty victory that we may battle against the forces of evil with courage and confidence. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. This section holds within it the very first promise of the Savior to come. He would come and he would defeat our greatest enemy, the devil. And that's what we're also going to see and hear uh, through the sermon text today. Now the serpent was more clever than any wild animal which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but not from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. God has said you shall not eat from it, you shall not touch it, or else you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. In fact, God knows that the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was appealing to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She gave some also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for their waists. They heard the voice of the Lord God, who was walking around in the garden during the cooler part of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Lord God said to the serpent, 
Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock, more than every wild animal. You shall crawl on your belly, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And here it is, the prophecy. I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. The word of the Lord. We sing verses 1 and 2 of A Mighty Fortress is Our God based on Psalm 46, so it is our psalm for the day, hymn number 863, verses 1 and 2. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. Adam's defeat meant death for all. It says here, then, though Christ, our champion's victory is also for all. So then, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so also death spread to all people because all sinned. For even before the law was given, sin was in the world. Now sin is not charged to one's account if there is no law. And yet death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those whose sin was not like the transgression of Adam, who is a pattern of the one who was to come. But the gracious gift is not like Adam's trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of this one man, it is even more certain that God's grace And the gift given by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many. And the gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment that followed the one trespass resulted in a verdict of condemnation. But the gracious gift that followed many trespasses resulted in a verdict of justification. Indeed, if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man, It is even more certain that those who receive the overflowing grace of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So then, just as one trespass led to a verdict of condemnation for all people, so also one righteous verdict led to life, giving justification for all people. 
For just as through the disobedience of one man the many became sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will become righteous. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation and the holy gospel. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. The Holy Gospel serving also as the sermon text is taken from Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city. He placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not test the Lord your God. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, I will give you all of these things if you will bow down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and just then angels came and served him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We ask you to fill out one of the white attendance guest cards in front of you. You can do that also using the QR code. Those online can use the link that is provided or the QR code. Completed forms help us to serve you all better, to get to know our guests all the more, and also to encourage God's people in their worship life. We continue our worship as we sing the next hymn, hymn number 829. The choir will be singing tomorrow at 745 live, but they made a recording, and so we're going to sing with the choir through that recording, and we're going to start singing immediately or whenever you feel comfortable. Hymn number 829, Take Heart.
Jesus battles and overcomes the devil. May his victory give you strength and comfort throughout your life, dear Christian friends. Many of you recently watched the Super Bowl, quite a contest, quite a battle between two teams, and some would bring it down to a battle between two quarterbacks, quite a battle. But there is a battle that is far more important than any Super Bowl. It is one that, as we study it, we see that it has so many wonderful results for God's people. It is one we're able to look at play by play, play by play. It really is a battle that was going on the entire time from when Jesus was born into this world to when he died on the cross and was buried. But we are going to take a look at this battle that happened in the wilderness or in the desert. And God had foretold this battle that it was going to be happening. And he had said that his son would come to destroy the works of the devil. He would come, as Genesis told us already today, to crush the devil's head, taking away his accusing power, his condemning power over us. Our text says right away, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Why? He must battle. It had to take place. He was going to fight for you and for me. This is our hero. This is our champion. This is the one who was our substitute, our replacement, the one who could do what we couldn't do, and now he's going into battle. Let's take a look at how Jesus overcomes the devil's temptations. And he overcame the devil for us. And his victory we learn from as it shows us how to win as well says in our text, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus is hungry. 40 days and 40 nights without food. I looked it up. Someone might be able to go a couple of months without food. Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights. You can just imagine what he looked like, skin and bones, his ribs showing. He was hungry and tired. And, and that's what the devil usually attacks, is the weakest point, the weakest place he goes for. And that's what he did with this first temptation as he said, well, why don't you just do a miracle? You're hungry. Think about yourself, Jesus. Change these stones into bread and then you got food to eat. Ah, don't wait for God, your Father, to take care of you. Take care of it yourself. You know, it sounds good at first. And Jesus had power to do it, of course. But what would it have done? What would it be indicating? It would be indicating that Jesus did not trust his Father to provide for him. And Jesus never used a miracle for himself in a selfish way. He would have been thinking about himself and what he was going through. And Jesus makes the clear point, using Scripture, that we trust in God first. By the way, keep that in mind, how he used Scripture again and again and again to defeat the devil, because that's a lesson for all of us. It says, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. If you had the Bible right here, the Word of God, and you had a loaf of bread over here, and you were super hungry, and you were given the choice, it's one or the other take the bread or you take the word. Which one are you going to take? You're going to take the word. The bread does not nourish unless God blesses it to nourish. He is behind everything that we have that is good. And that's what Jesus did. He put his trust in his heavenly Father to provide. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. These words, this is a quote from the Old Testament. In the wilderness, they're wandering. The Israelites are wandering around, and they're complaining, they're murmuring. They're hungry. And Jesus was humbling them as he was causing them to be without food. That's what it says. And then this section, this quote, is from Genesis. Man shall not live by bread alone. Excuse me, Deuteronomy. Shall live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus knew. He knew that. He loved the Word of God. It's His Word, and He perfectly trusted in the Lord. That's the first temptation. So He routed, He repulsed the devil, but not overcome yet. Here comes the second. Then the devil took Him into the holy city. He placed Him on the pinnacle of the temple, and He said to Him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. In the prior temptation, Jesus had demonstrated perfect trust in his heavenly Father. And that's where the attack of the devil took place, against his trust in God to provide. The devil twisted scripture, misused it, made it say what he wanted it to say. So many people do that today. They take it out of context and they twist it. And that's what he did. He said, doesn't it say in the Bible that God will send his angels to watch over you? Of course, the answer to that is yes, of course God says that. But when you put yourself in a position where you are dictating to God to prove himself, when you are telling God that he has to prove his promise to you, you are tempting the Lord God. You are testing God. And Jesus saw right through it. And he said, again, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. He tore to shreds. The devil's temptation. Again, this comes from the Old Testament. Moses, writing to the Israelites, here are the full words in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test the way you tested him at Massah. Massah was a place that they had reached in their wanderings in the wilderness, and now they didn't have any water. And you know how far they went? They grumbled and complained against God to the point where they said, you brought us out here to die? It would have been far better if we would have stayed in Egypt. Remember what they were in Egypt? They were slaves in Egypt. And God said that you're putting me to the test. You are tempting me. You are pushing it, is what he was saying. Moses wrote, do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you. In other words, trust the Lord God. This temptation was to get Jesus to mistrust the Lord God. To put his trust in himself. What We got one more temptation, don't we? Here comes this final supreme effort by the devil. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, I will give you all of these things if you will bow down and worship me. The height of presumption. Lying. Thinking he owns all of that. God owns all things. But the devil is a liar, of course. And he's lying here. But the Bible does call him the prince of this world. And why is that? It's because he tempts so many and so many give themselves over to the devil and the devil's temptation to love the world, to love money, to love stuff, to love things. Jesus saw right through this one too. And he said, 
Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil was trying to get Jesus to come to love power and wealth and things of this world above God. Jesus says, go away, Satan. Worship the Lord your God, it says in the Bible. Again, this is one that is taken from the Old Testament. Moses warned Israel this. When God brings you into the land, he swore to give you. And then he mentions the good things that God gives. Houses full of good things and the like. And you are satisfied. Be careful not to forget the Lord. Worship and serve him only. Jesus said, nope. No way. God is first. Then the devil, it says, left him. And just then angels came and served him. Then the devil left him. He overcame. He overcame the devil's temptations. He defeated the devil for us. This is our hero. This is our champion. And his victory is our victory. His righteousness is our righteousness. That's what God's word says. It says in the Bible, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. It was all important for him to go to battle the devil and for him to be perfect. For that perfection is yours. It makes you right in the sight of God. His victory is ours. As we have enjoyed hearing the victory of our Lord, his overcoming of Satan, we are led to want to fight too. To fight for our Savior who loved us first. To fight for our Savior who overcame for us. Who took our place. Who suffered and paid for our sins. And so we too go into battle every single day. As the devil is out to get us. He wants us to fall. He comes with a temptation. And this comes from the first one. He says, you know, it doesn't do any good to trust in God. Take a look at the things that are going on in your life. You're, you're sick, maybe. You maybe have lost your job. Maybe you're suffering the death of a loved one. Maybe there's stress over a relationship. You know what you're going through. And then the devil comes and says, see, God really doesn't care about you. Don't trust in God. Trust in yourself. Do for yourself what you need to do. That's the way to go. And then as God's people, what do we remember? We remember God saying, I'm with you always to the very end of the world. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I have redeemed you. You are mine. Promise after promise. And it strengthens us to overcome. In regard to the second temptation, the devil comes and he says, you know, God forgives you, right? The Bible says that. Well, you just go ahead and sin all you want. The more you sin, the more God will forgive you. Just keep on sinning. Enjoy life. Take in all the pleasures of this world, all those sinful things, because God will just keep on forgiving you. Oh, no. Lord Jesus quoted, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the last temptation, the devil comes and says, look at the riches of the world. Aren't they great? You got to have some of that. If you don't have that, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be joyful. You're not going to be at peace. You, you see it all the time, that same message. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Take a look at what they got. Don't you want that? Why don't you just go after that? Forget about God and his word. That's not important. What is important would be the things of this world. The Lord Jesus says, no. Fight on, fight on. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so we battle. So we fight. And why do we do that? Because of Christ's victory. His victory over the devil. It gives us strength. It gives us motivation. It gives us the love of Christ to keep on going. To fight the good fight. To run the race all the way to the end until we're home. Home in heaven. Amen.
Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith in the one true God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As the baskets are going around, you can also place that attendance guest card in one of them. And as you give your offerings, whether here or online or dropping them off at the church, we'll be dedicating them all as the offering baskets are brought forward. Let's sing the next song, hymn number 574, The Tree of Life.
Before we pray the responsive prayer of the church, we pray for Lisa Lang, who is presently hospitalized at UW in Madison. We pray. Dear Lord, we come to you and ask you for your continued blessing and protection on Lisa Lang. We thank you for the care already given to her and the healing that you have already brought about. Continue to strengthen and heal her according to your grace and plan. Ever not doubt that you are ever near and that you deal with her according to your love. Continue to remind us all of your compassion that freely lends help in trouble, cure for illness, healing in wounds, relief from pain, most of all forgiveness for all our sins. Gracious Father, after his baptism, your son faced the stern attacks of Satan, who tried to derail his journey to the cross. On this day, we rejoice in Jesus' victory in the wilderness and praise him for his ultimate triumph over the works of the devil. Satan and his followers seek to overturn our faith and love every day. Their goal is to separate us from your presence and destroy our relationship with your Son. Give us wisdom to be alert for their attacks and recognize the danger they bring. Make our faith stronger than it is now so that we might know more and more that Jesus matters most to us in life and death. Give us wisdom and power to follow him and do his will. According to your will, Lord, curb the influence of Satan in our world and society. Help people to grasp the appalling effects of his power and to refrain from doing wicked and harmful deeds. Give us courage to warn those we love about the dangers of the devil's temptations. Lead us to speak the truth in love so that family members and friends may discern evil and step back from error and sin. Keep in your care all who are struggling with pain, battling with sickness, and facing death. Spare your people from Satan's temptations in their difficult hours, and strengthen them with the promise of your Son's ultimate victory over sin, death, and the grave. Protect us, gracious God, from the power of Satan, the allure of the world, and the seduction of our sinful nature. We continue as we sing the next hymn, verses 1 through 3 of hymn number 842, Jesus Still Lead On.
Please stand. We go to our Lord in prayer, and after the first prayer, we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing as we sing verse 4 of Jesus Still Lead On. So good to see you all. I have a few announcements, and then we'd like to show you the next segment of the Wells Connection. Tomorrow we have Bible class from 9.10 to 10.10 with refreshments beforehand, and we're going to be attacking the devil's lie that God is disinterested. He doesn't really care. You're welcome to come back for that Bible study. Of course, there's Sunday school and also youth Bible study. We had a lot of fun at the Pine Car Derby today. Over at the gym of the school, it was the district one. Tomorrow is just St. John's one. And just come and have some fun. Even if you don't have a car, that's okay. Just come and have some fun. And it's all set up, ready to go in the gym. And check in for those that do have cars, 1230. And it'll start at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Once again, it's a, it's a fun time. Wednesday is Bible study at 10 o'clock. You're invited to that. This Wednesday, also, we have Lenten services, 3.30, and the Luther Prep Choir will be with us, the older ones. That's at 3.30. There's a meal in between, 4.15 to 6.15, and then 7 o'clock we have worship again. Uh, we're looking for ushers to sign up, especially for the 7 o'clock service. This Friday and Saturday, coming Friday and Saturday, Friday at 6 o'clock, and Saturday at 1.30, we'll have our school musical over, uh, I believe it's in the gym as well, uh, and that, that's a, a good time. They always do such a great job with that. Again, that's Friday and Saturday. All the details are found in the bulletin. There's also the Luther Prep musical and also concert, and you'll find when and where uh, in the bulletin. We called at our call meeting this past week, we called Mrs. Cynthia Goot, as our grade six teacher and athletic director. And I do have a letter that she wrote here. I'd like to read it to you quickly. Dear members of St. John's, I am honored to have received the call to serve as your sixth grade teacher and athletic director. As I consider this call and my current call at Trinity, I pray that the Lord will use this opportunity to help me evaluate my ministry and lead me to a decision of where he will best be able to use me in his ministry. As I contemplate this call, please keep my family and the ministries at both Trinity and St. John's in your prayers. In Christ, Cindy Goot. Bethany Babinick, who's our organist today, she declined the call that she had. 
Good news, good to be keeping you around. Well, as Lutherans for Life, we have those baby bottles that we're encouraging you to get back as soon as possible. I believe they're going to be picked up on Monday. And that's to support Lutherans for Life. And then check out the rest of the items like Ladies' Night Out and Easter Flowers and Wish List, all in the worship folder. Read it from beginning to end. There are a lot of details in there. Good to see you. Let's watch the next Wells Connection. God bless you all. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Martin Luther College in New Ulm, Minnesota, which trains our future pastors, teachers, and staff ministers, is transitioning to a new strategic plan. It's an important effort to better recruit and serve students so that our Lord may send more laborers into his harvest field. When the skies are blue and filled with sunshine, Athletic teams at Martin Luther College can enjoy practice and training sessions outside. But when there's snow or inclement weather, besides overscheduling the MLC gymnasium, there was really few other options for the teams to practice. That is, until now. We therefore dedicate the Benny Cohn Field House in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The new Betty Cohn Field House was dedicated in fall of 2022. This 36,000 square foot indoor training and practice facility was built to serve the entire student body and includes locker rooms, batting cages, and golf simulators. The ceiling is high enough that the baseball and softball teams can practice pop flies, while the football and soccer teams have space to kick and punt. Make no mistake of it, th this is not our chapel. We do not worship sports on our campus, as, but here too, we're reminded, we celebrate our Lord's overwhelming goodness. For God did not create us as disembodied souls who just like float through life. He made us body and soul creatures, intimately connected physically and spiritually. I love it. I, it's awesome. I remember when we uh, first walked in for our first practice, we were all just kind of like, oh, like this shining moment. In the past, our only turf practice would be in games. So we were pretty severely unprepared for games against other teams in the conference. So it's been a huge blessing. When sophomore Lily Zimpelman was considering life after high school, she had no doubts about coming to Martin Luther College. However, not all of her classmates shared the same feeling. Some were much more on the fence about it. Our admissions department has to compete in a very competitive atmosphere. I mean, we want to appeal to a high school student that will consider full-time ministry. And at the same time, you know, not every student knows coming out of high school whether or not they want to be a pastor, teacher, or a staff minister. But if they are just considering it, we want to give them a really good, high quality for your college campus experience. And uh, that's what I think a field house like this can provide. But the field house is just one part of encouraging future students to consider enrolling here. Martin Luther College also plans to boost financial aid continue to enhance its campus and extend its reach through its strategic plan called Pursuing Excellence Under the Cross. And that will be extremely important when they are perusing the landscape of post-secondary options that are out there. And we really want to be um, excellent in all that we do, especially for our students. This field house and increased financial aid can certainly have an effect on incoming students but it also sends an important message to those students currently studying for the ministry who are seeing these tangible investments of support for their college and them personally. It's kind of cool to see how many congregation members in the Wells 
are so excited to see us in the ministry and we get we get encouraged so often like day on a day-to-day -day basis about how important this work is that we are furthering God's kingdom and teaching people about, about Jesus. It doesn't have to be the Taj Mahal but it's okay for them to stay in a nice dorm. It's okay for them to have a nice practice field, right? Because again, what we're doing is emphasizing this is important. What, what you're coming to school to learn and train and grow in your faith in a significant way and impact the world, we want to give you the tools and the resources to be able to do that the very best that you can. There's a huge shortage right now of pastors and teachers and staff ministers in the wells. And this is where they're trained. We so badly want to fill those pulpits and those empty classrooms because uh, there's no more important mission than uh, for our college to equip and train future ministers to meet the uh, needs of the wells. Simply put, the more students that enroll at Martin Luther College or participate in its competency-based education program, the more opportunities there are for future called workers. Called workers that will, God willing, carry the good news of our Lord to people in our synod and to mission fields around the world.